The book reviews are upon us again. It took a minute because I was reading a trilogy, as I told you. It's three books, one story. Amazing. This is The Immortals of Meluha. And then it's uh, followed by The Secret of the Nagas and The Oath of the Vayuputras. All these are the trilogy of Shiva, the Lord Shiva. So what, from the knowledge that I just know, it felt for me, just being a Christian, it felt for me like this is the Jesus of Hindu because even the book itself is based in ancient India and it's basically describing the it's basically describing the Indian gods so well this is the story of Lord Shiva and my goodness my goodness my goodness everyone I was recommending these books to I was telling them this is literally the Game of Thrones Bollywood edition and I was so glad when at the back of the last book I actually saw the Hindustan Times actually said that this is the Indian Lord of the Rings so yes yes please I feel affirmed my goodness the action going on in these books you let us start from here let us start by describing now the author's method of writing like the amish himself the author is amish and amish writes these books in a certain way remember when we were talking about chimamanda's vivid description of things let me tell you chimamanda got to that competition and found amish there <laughs> amish describes you can taste you can taste the pictures in your mind. You can, my goodness. I remember specifically two things that, that I could picture so well were the interior designs of the temples and the war scenes where they are charging, where they are attacking, where the swords fighting and all that. You can picture it in your head. The last war where Sati, Sati now is the wife of Shiva, where Sati is fighting assassins. You can, there's a, there's a, there's a part where the sword, the sword hits her left side of the head and the impact is so hard that her left eye falls either into or out of the socket. And you can see everything. The way, the way she now just like tries to get her balance and she's staggering and the way she gets her balance back and the way she's now using one, one side of her eye for vision only and her tearing a cloth from already a dead soldier and tying it on that eye. My goodness. My goodness. <laughs> it's arc. Sure. When we say Lord of the Rings, when we say Game of Thrones, it's for real. It's, there's nothing left to imagine. Like everything is painted out for you in clear color. Okay, and I've not even watched Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings. It, let me tell you, it's just the diehards who decided that we will not rest. They posted memes, they posted spoilers, they posted everything. So now, us just seated passively on the side, spectating, we now know the plot and some cast from just these shows, and we've never watched them. And the other thing is very weird is that I can never, I, you will never find me sitting down watching a show that has blood, swords, that spatter of blood, I cannot stand it. But somehow if it's in a book, and it's me who has to create those pictures for myself in my head, it just, it's fine, it's fine. I really don't understand that but <laughs> here we are and i my goodness my goodness the, the the trilogy of shiva my good gosh anyway that is one thing that amish does that is very good the, the vivid description the other thing i noticed about amish i have not had this in any other book i've not seen it with any other author is you see how even in movies there's usually a subject like this is olive and then probably there's olive's family or olive's best friend there's usually a key subject that then the whole story revolves around which i get of course this is lord shiva and sati and the story just revolves around them but there's a way shiva is like you're there's a way for for amish it's like you're seated in the sky and you're watching different people's lives simultaneously at the same time so it's not only Shiva and Sati. There's there is the the, the father. There's the father-in-law. There's the uncle. There's the grandfather to the uncle. There's the friend. There's the best friend. That best friend has a wife. The wife. The mother to that. One. Like there there are so many subjects that you can follow through with their stories and their life, and then then they're not the main subject. Like he he's able to take you. You're able to see the whole of all the Indian empires functioning at the same time that was that was mind-boggling for me i'd never thought in my head ever that you'd follow a book three books you're following three books a whole story and you're seeing different people like you can tell what the empire on the other side of the sand sweep is, is going through you can tell like so many things are going on there's the there's the vishnus these are like the the, the men of cloth the wife's men all of that you're following up multiple characters it's literally like watching a movie but now in written form i thought that was brilliant i really really thought that was just absolutely out of this world now on to the book and the story itself let me tell you this story is developing 
Hey, so um, let me let me just start. The first book takes you through like just now the introduction of Lord Shiva. He's a very common person. No one even thought he'd ever be God. Even him himself, he didn't expect to be a God. He's just there. And then we see the introduction of Lord Shiva and then he makes a mistake. What I loved about this, as much as it's fictional, what makes it different from Christianity is that you would never write a book like this about Jesus. <laughs> it's because they think it's blasphemous, it's blasphemous. But even in the first book, we see that Shiva does a grave mistake, a grave mistake, and it ends there. So, Amish makes sure you have to look for the second book to see how Shiva fixes his mistake. <laughs> and in the second book, when you think, okay, now here we're gonna, maybe things are gonna settle down, the plot twist. Let me tell you, African hairstylists have nothing on the plot twist that comes in in the second book. Like you see, in the first book, the um, Sati, now his wife, is, is a Vikrama. A Vikrama are people who are like cast out from the society because they, they, they went through a certain misfortune that is believed that is a punishment for something that they did in their previous life. So Sati had a steel bath and that's considered punishment for something she did in her in her previous life and therefore she was a fikama and she was passed out shiva came on he was just like what in the what in the nonsense is going on here this does not make sense so then he abolishes that rule and takes shiva as his wife and in the second book <laughs> that's still born you see that still bath is not so still that child is alive <laughs> my goodness everything is just like Ooh, and you're like, by the time I was getting to the third book, this is now the author of the Vayuputras, and it's the last book, it's 600 pages, so if you don't have the dedication, my friend, <laughs> but I promise you, you can't put this book down. I was reading this book at the edge of my, seated at the edge of my bed, I'm trembling, my teeth are sweating, I'm like, in the house where I pay rent with my own money that I go to, to work hard for, I, like, you cannot read this book and stay still. It is, it is engulfing, it is intriguing, it is... It is addictive. I will dare say these books are addictive because you cannot dare not finish this story. The minute you begin, you have to finish all the three books. You have to. There is no other option. But anyway, um, so on to the lessons that I'm learning from this book. So one that I found very interesting was the in the first book, there is something, it's almost like the caste system. I can't remember the names uh, exactly, but it's um, the kids are not born and then you take care of them like your parents, like we do right now. Your parents take care of you. The kids are born and then they're taken to one place where they are all raised together. And then whatever inclination you have naturally, I think, Think, or whatever your strengths lie, then you're assigned a particular family and you serve in that role as your purpose in life. So let's say, and they have different tattoos. They have like different signs for different for different people serving in different um, service areas. So let's say you have a pigeon tattoo. That probably is someone who serves in service, in a messenger or something. Um, someone else could have maybe a lion tattoo. I don't remember the animals per se, but you then you serve in leadership. If someone is has a particular tattoo, they serve in, in the army. So you know, you can tell what someone does immediately by just looking at them and seeing the sign that they have, which I found was very interesting. That was also abolished because it was, it was just like, let kids take yeah, let parents take care of their kids and live with their kids. I don't know why it was abolished. It, the, the, the system really made sense <laughs> to me. And then something else that I found very interesting. This was now in the second book. I remember I even put... Um, this is the secret of the Nagas, if you need to refer to what I'm talking about. And this is page 50 to around page 52. So here Shiva is looking for basically just guidance, wisdom, because he needs to identify the evil and abolish evil. So first of all, the first thing that you learn in this book that is very beautiful to me is that evil is not something independent in its, in its entirety. Evil is something that once existed as a good thing. Like if I need to drink water, I'm drinking water, but when I get to now drinking 50 liters of water in a day, now that's not good. So I found that very interesting that evil is not, when you're going to search for evil, evil is not here and this is not, this is not bad or good. And it gave me the idea of how we say immorality or sin or good and bad things are very fluid. It usually just really depends on the situation at hand. Even right now, like when we are talking about the Mamito issue and the Joey issue, you can literally tell like it, this is something very fluid. It will depend on where you're standing for you to decide whether something is good or bad. So I found that very, very insightful. And something else that now you'll see in that page 50 of the second book is they talk about the feminine and the masculine um, energies. So apparently there are so many unique ways, like every whatever whatever empire whatever systems whatever govern governments in the world think that their 
their way of ruling or their system of governance is unique to them. But it all boils down to two things, the feminine and the masculine system. Now, let me see if I can find what they referred the masculine system to. Uh, it is the underlying masculine directive, which is very clear. Laws are unchangeable and must be followed rigidly. Meluha is a perfect example of such way of life. Its people live by the code of truth, duty, and honor. So that is the masculine energy, truth, duty, and honor. And they are very specific rules that need to be followed and then the feminine one um the feminine way of life is life by probabilities there are no absolutes nothing is black or white people choose their course of action based on the probabilities of different outcomes perceived at a point in time for example they'll follow a king who they think has higher probability of remaining in power um, the moment the probabilities change, so do their loyalties. Change is the only constant. Femi feminine, feminine civilizations like sword sweep, like sword weep God, are comfortable with contradictions. The codes for success in such a system, the feminine system, is passion, beauty, and freedom. And for the masculine was truth, duty, and honor. So then that chapter continues to explain how the masculine and the feminine um, systems cannot exist on their own. The masculine system can the masculine system works just fine as it is but it gets to a point where it has to borrow aspects of the feminine system and so does this feminine system it works just fine and it works really well but at some point it will have to borrow aspects of the masculine system and this is not just in systems of governance this is even in us as human beings we all have uh, masculine and feminine energies and we have to balance it out so of course men are born with a default higher masculine uh, masculine energy and women are born with a default higher feminine energy now at this point you you can't be all feminine there's parts of you that have to like acquire some masculine energy for you to just like be a balanced human being and same for men and in some cases there are actually systems where you can find a, a girl who has maybe a higher percentage of a masculine energy and you might find a man who might have a higher percentage of a feminine energy so it doesn't make anyone wrong it doesn't make anyone less of a human being than the other i just thought that was very very interesting to me so those are some of the things that i was picking up but i'm guessing for different people you pick up different lessons depending on what resonates with your life but this book my goodness is a story and a half yet yeah, my this this she like by the time he gets to the end <sighs> he's, he's lived a good life. Have you ever read a story and you're just like, he's worth being God. He's worth being God. But anyway, the other thing that I also mentioned in some previous books that I reviewed, here I see women. I see women. I see women every day. The, every day you wake up, there's a woman in a scene. There's because in in the like the books we've read, like um some of the lessons, even some of the things that you'll pick, the insights that you'll pick from these books, are, are, are insights that you're picking from those motivational books, the monk who sold his Ferrari, the alchemist. You're gonna pick those lessons here, but very subtly because it's put in a well put story, and you're gonna realize that um all these lessons are interesting in a way that. They'll teach you something. They'll teach you something. It's just not in your face. But I love, I love that about this book. I love that this book is beautiful. I can see women in it. Women are busy. Like, women, even, even, a, a, in fact, I think the doctor is a woman. Yeah. I see women in this. And then women are not placed. It's not a book that wants to empower women. So women are put in a position of power. And it's not a book that is also dehumanizing women. So women are just existing. The same way you'd go to work, meet a co-worker who's a woman. The same way your best friend might be a, a woman. The same way someone who's serving you might be a woman. I felt like it was so naturally placed. Everything in the book was just a day-to-day -day life. It is beautiful. My goodness, my goodness. The What is it called? Is, is it called the morality conflict? That morality conflict that people usually have <laughs> you'll have so many of them in this book ah, you'll have so many of them but I, you will enjoy this book so you really really will so remember um uh, the trilogy of shiva by amish the first book is the immortals of menluha the second book is the secret of the nagas and the third book is the oath of the value putras if you don't enjoy this book you don't know good things you don't know good things and until the next book bye
Hey, so just a quick one. I got the first book on the streets. These people who sell books on the streets in Uganda, Kampala, Uganda. And then the second and the third one, I got them in the supermarket. It was either Naivas or Taskies, and they were selling it at the book first. It was an offer, so they were going for about 200 bob each. But that was an offer. But I think without the offer, it's probably going for 500 bob. Um, this is Kenyan shillings. So they are very accessible. You'll just find them wherever, in the supermarket, wherever. So, yeah, they're accessible books. These ones you won't have to struggle to get.